Okay, part three uh, in our foray into uh, chain rule type stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and let's do f of x is equal to uh, sine squared x plus cosine squared x. Okay? Now, I know that in each term, the chain rule is going to be used. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. I mean, we can actually rewrite this if we want. We have sine x squared plus cosine x squared. Okay, and we have, uh, let's go ahead, that stuff squared, so it winds up being 2 times sine times the derivative of the inside, which is cosine. Let's go ahead and go to the second term. I know that I bring down the 2 cosine x, and the derivative of cosine is going to be, of course, negative sine x. And when I simplify this, I get 2 sine x cosine x minus 2 sine x cosine x. Oh, wait a minute, that's 0. Hmm. Well, it might be the fact that that right there is Pythagorean identity. Okay? That is equal to 1 which of course, if we differentiate any constant function, we're going to get zero, okay? So, not only is that a wonderful excuse to go through and practice the chain rule, that is a wonderful question that reminds us that we need to be very, very careful about simplifying when we can, okay? Because this right here, while not inordinately difficult, is considerably more difficult than this right here. This, of course, is much easier because the derivative of a constant is zero uh, if you just remember and to simplify. So it's the whole stop, think, then do, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and look at one over uh, t squared plus three t minus one. Now, I could do this by the quotient rule. Uh, but I shouldn't. First of all, the quotient rule opens us up to a whole lot of careless errors because most people don't know the quotient rule. They have an aversion to it, or they don't know it as well as they know the other rules. They have an aversion to it. So what we really need to remember is that anytime we have something in the denominator, we need to go ahead and just rewrite it to the negative one power. And after that, this becomes a general power rule problem and it winds up being stuff to the negative one. Well, stuff to the negative one is negative one stuff to the negative two times the derivative of stuff. Well, the derivative of that is relatively easy. It's a, it's a polynomial, so we just do it term by term. 2t plus 3, or when it's simplified, negative 2t minus 3 over t squared plus 3t minus 1 squared. Okay, and of course, whether you need to actually put it into this form or not is up to your teacher. And as I've said before, you need to ask your teacher whether that is indeed the form. But, you know, that's not that hard to actually get there. Okay, but you need to remember, just like radicals are general power rule questions in disguise, so are reciprocal functions like this. This is a general power rule question in disguise. Okay, now... Let's go ahead and get on to the next question. Uh, let's say we have y is equal to sine cube root of x plus the cube root of sine x. And teachers and textbooks love this kind of question right here, of course, because it underscores uh, what we were talking about in an earlier video. The fact that these are two distinct composite functions, but they are comprised of the same contributing function, just in a different order. So if I have, let's say I have um, f of x is equal to the cube root of x, and g of x is equal to sine x, then this right here is g of f of x, and this right here is f of g of x. And that shouldn't really be all that hard to see, okay? I mean, you're cube rooting 
and you're signing, right? Uh, the question is which goes first? Here the cube root goes before the sign, and here the sign goes before the cube root. Okay, well, let's go ahead and differentiate that. I know that this is sine of stuff, so I get cosine of stuff times the derivative of stuff, right? The next one is that's stuff to the one-third. So I get one-third stuff to the negative two-thirds times the derivative of that stuff, which of course is cosine x. And this right here is my g prime of f of x. This right here is my f prime of x. And that, of course, is the chain rule for this first term. This right here is the chain rule for the second term. This right here is my f prime of g of x. And this right here is my g prime of x. Now, if you don't really care for the notation, the notation isn't very helpful, just ignore me, that's fine. Uh, but some people are formula kind of people and they need to see that sort of analytic work in order to make sense out of that problem, okay? Now, let's go ahead and move on to an equation of a tangent line uh, in terms of a chain rule. Uh, so let's say we have s of t is equal to the square root of t squared plus 2t plus 8, and we want to get the tangent line at the point 2, 4. So equation of the tangent line, okay? Now, uh, what we need to remember is, okay, well, first of all, is that point on this curve? Well, it's easy enough to figure out, right? Let's go ahead and plug in 2 and confirm the fact that we get 4. So we plug in 2, and we're going to get 2 squared plus 2 times 2, plus 8, which is 16, the square root of which, of course, is 4. So yeah, that point is on the curve. Now, in order to get the equation of any line that I'm asked for, I need point and slope. Now, in order to get the equation of a tangent line, I need the point of tangency and the slope at the point of tangency. But it's still point and slope. I have the point. All I need is the slope. And of course, that's the whole purpose of doing all of this, is the fact that the derivative function is a slope function, right? S prime describes the slope of S at any t value. So I have 1 half t squared plus 2t plus 8. And remember that negative 1 half, that's the key mistake that people will make, OK? times the derivative of the inside, which is 2t plus 2. Uh, now, of course, that has a common factor of 2, which can cancel with the 1 half. Uh, so if I want to simplify it, I go ahead and get 2 da, 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 and put the tail on that t so it doesn't look like another addition sign. Uh, and that is my derivative. Now, it should be easy enough to go ahead and evaluate it, because you already know that when you plug 2 into that radical, you're going to get 4. The question is, what happens when you plug 2 into the numerator? So s prime of 2 is going to be 3 fourths. Okay, well, that's kind of neat. I have my slope. I have my point. All I need to do is just put it into point slope form. And that is the equation of the tangent line for that function at that ordered pair, okay? And of course, you're just going to have to figure out whether your teacher wants you to take it from the point slope and put it into slope intercept. I will go ahead and let you know that on the AP exam, if it's a free response question, that is unnecessary. Now, if it's a, if it's a multiple choice question, uh, you're just going to have to put it into the form that all the multiple choice answers are in, whether it be point slope or whether it be slope intercept. But on free response, you are not obligated to change it from that into anything else. Okay? Now, we've been avoiding this for the first two of the uh, uh, for the first two of the videos, but now we need to go ahead and do a problem uh, with exponentials. Okay, so let's say we have y is equal to e to the 2 minus 9x squared. Okay, 
when you're dealing with exponentials and you're dealing with it where it's not just e to the x, it's e to the function or some expression involving x, that the exponent is the inside. The exponent is your g of x, okay? Uh, so if I wanted to actually explicitly write this out, the outside is the base, the inside is the exponent. This is f of g of x. This is g of x crammed into that exponent. So that's the inside right here, okay? But really, when we take the derivative of this, it winds up being relatively simple because what is the derivative of e to the stuff? <laughs> or e to stuff? Without the, you know, without the article, it sounds kind of weird. e to stuff is just e to stuff times the derivative of stuff. That's it, okay? So if you have, if you're asked to take the derivative of e to the u, where u is understood to be a, some function of x, it's e to the u times u prime, or du dx, however you want to put it, okay? So that's the specific rule for how the chain rule relates to exponential functions of base e. Now, in the next couple of sections, you'll start to get, you'll, you'll actually be introduced to a more general form of exponentials for the exponentials that, you know, have base other than e. So base 2 and 3 and 17 or whatever it is, okay? But for right now, we're just going to be concentrating on e until such time as we get to uh, uh, what's called logarithmic differentiation. And that will be the point at which I can actually uh, sort of justify to you uh, why we know uh, that the uh, that the derivative of e to the x is actually e to the x. Okay. Now let's do another one involving exponentials. This one, of course, is going to be a little bit more complicated because why in the world will we keep things simple? Um, cosine e to the two x, the whole quantity cubed. So cosine cubed e to the 2x. Now what is the most outside thing that's going on here in this chain rule problem? Well, and sometimes, and I don't always do this, uh, but you know, in the first couple of rounds uh, when I'm teaching people the chain rule, I like to always rewrite it from the efficient or the lazy man's version of raising a trig function to a power to a more explicit one that actually shows the layering of the composition of functions. This shows the layering. This doesn't really, okay? So we notice that the most outside thing going on here is the cubing. The next thing that's going on is the cosigning. The next thing that's going on is the exponentializing. And the next thing that's going on is the times two, okay? Uh, so it, it is four layers. Now that last layer is a bit weak, so it's kind of like, you know, three and a half because that last layer is a linear, right? And, who really has difficulty in taking the derivative of linear functions. Uh, but let's go ahead and we have, we have stuff cubed. So stuff cubed becomes three stuff squared. And then of course I have to deal with the stuff. Uh, now that's cosine. Now if we sort of take away the outer layer, we're now left with cosine of stuff. Well, cosine of stuff winds up being negative sine of stuff. We peel off that layer. We have e to the stuff, right? Next layer is e to the stuff. So we have e to the stuff times the derivative of that stuff, and that's basically it, okay? Uh, and of course your teacher may actually want you to, you know, collect the 3 and the negative and the 2 in order to give yourself a nice neat coefficient out in front. Uh, but that's, that would of course be simplification, that's algebra and arithmetic. This right here, that's the calculus. Now if you understand that, then you're really well on your way to understanding the chain rule, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and do one more example, okay? Let's say we have y is equal to the square root of sine x cosine x. Now remember earlier we had a problem where the outermost thing going on was a product and the, and the composite function was inside the product. Well here we have a product 
inside of another function. So the outermost thing going on is the composition and the product is inside of it. So whereas in the previous example, we had the chain rule going on inside of the product rule. Here, if we leave it like this, we're going to have the product rule going on inside of the chain rule. Now, what do I mean by if we leave it like this? Well, you have to remember that when you're dealing with trig, there's always a possibility that you can change the form. And I've tried to, I've tried to teach you that when you approach a problem, don't just go into pure procedure mode. You need to stop, think, then do. Now, does this look like any identity that you happen to know? Well, I happen to know that 2 sine x cosine x is equal to sine 2x. That's a double angle identity that I learned last year, okay? Now, that is sine x cosine x, not 2 sine x cosine x. But if this is an identity, can't I change this identity into that? I sure can. Or I can, you know, take, or I can think about it this way. Take sine and cosine and multiply it by 2 and 1 half. And so you can actually change the form of this into 1 half sine of 2x, which is, of course, 1 half sine 2x to the 1 half. And that is going to be much, much easier to go ahead and take the derivative. Now we have dy dx, and of course that's stuff to the 1 half. And therefore, excuse me, we have 1 half stuff to the negative 1 half. And I'm going to reiterate, you have to remember that exponent right there. That is the easiest thing to forget. Uh, the derivative of the stuff, meaning the derivative of the inside, is 1 half cosine 2x times 2, right, because it's a th three layer function. That 1 half and the 2 cancel out. Okay? And so, you know, you can get, you know, 1 half over the square root of 1 half sine 2x. And of course, if your teacher wants you to simplify that, uh, you know, you've learned, I mean, it's a little bit complicated because there's, it's complex and you have a radical in the denominator, uh, but uh, you've learned how to do that in terms of algebraic skills. Now, uh, I think we're going to need uh, one more video in terms of chain rule because uh, I have several more examples that I'd like to walk through with you. Uh, I think after that, we're going to be done in terms of chain rule videos. Uh, but of course, if you, if you have any specific questions, I'd be more than happy to field them. Bye.